Man, I want to lock some things in this morning. Moses had the Ten Commandments, the thou shalt not. It's back in the book of Exodus. God said, I created the world, I created you. And if you're going to do life with other people and you're going to do life on my planet and you're going to do life with me, can't do certain things. So he gave us some non-negotiables back in Exodus. Then Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived on the planet, in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs 3, he gives us not some thou shalt nots, he gives us some it is wise not to, or it is wise that we do certain things. Solomon says, here's some non-negotiables for living a successful life. I mean, once you get the Ten Commandments down, if you still want to do life successful, relationship successful, Solomon says, here's some things that wisdom would tell you not to do. Here's some things that a wise person would do. So in Proverbs chapter 3, we got to lock some things in. We've got some things that the Bible tells us, if you want to live a successful life, lock them in from the beginning. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commandments in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you what? Say it. Peace and what? So here we go. He's saying, here's the wisdom to be able to have peace and prosperity. Here's a few things that you have got to lock in. And in chapter 3, verse 1, what Solomon is saying is lock this in, that the Word of God is a non-negotiable. The Word of God is a non-negotiable, that it will govern your life. It will guide your life. You will make it a priority at the beginning of your day, and you will think about it throughout the day. You'll spend time reading it. You'll spend time knowing it. You'll spend time remembering what God said in it, and you'll remember, and you'll spend time remembering what God did through it. Now, for those of you that don't see the, the uh, answers on the side screens or these points, I'm going to give you all of these points next week, so you don't have to write nothing down. I'm going to give you the 10 things, the 10 non-negotiables, what we need to lock in. I'll give you the verses that go along with that, and then I'll probably email those to you as well because we have a tendency to forget. And what Solomon is saying is, you can't forget. Because when you forget, it dishonors. If you forget your anniversary, you are dishonoring that person. If you forget a birthday, it's dishonoring that individual whose birthday it is. If you forget something that God said, something that God did, if you forget the Lord's Day on, on, to be in church and worshiping Him, it dishonors the person whose day or whose thing you're trying to remember. But God also knows that we have an enemy that attacks our minds. And in attacking our minds, what the enemy's trying to get us to do is to forget the last time you got a raise when you need it. To forget the last time you prayed that a child's fever would disappear, and it disappeared. To forget how God came through for you in a family situation where you needed his help or everything was going to be in chaos. It's those things that are out of our mind very quickly. And since Solomon knew that, he said, look, you've got to lock this one in that the Word of God would take top priority in your life. The Bible says in Psalms 106 on the side screen, even so he saved them. Now this is God talking about the children of Israel to defend and honor his name. In other words, God saved his kids to make God look good. And then he said, and to demonstrate his mighty power. He was trying to get them, lock something into their mind that they would remember. He commanded the Red Sea to dry up. He led Israel across the sea as it were a desert. He rescued them from their enemies, and he redeemed them from their foes. Then the water returned and covered their enemies. Not one of them survived. Then his people believed his promise, and they sang his praises. We talked about that at the beginning of worship. They believed his promises, and they sang his praises. And then in my Bible, I don't know if it's like this in your Bible, but like this much further down in my Bible is verse 13. And verse 13 says this, Yet how quickly they forgot what he had done, and they wouldn't wait for his counsel. Can you, really? You're going to dry up a river? You're going to destroy all my enemies? And yet that much in the Bible, you're going to forget what he has done, and you're not going to wait on his counsel to tell you what to do? Listen, the Bible tells us, and this is what Solomon says, there are some things, if you're going to be successful in life, you've got to put them in cement. You've got to lock them in. And the first thing is you have got to make the Word of God a top priority in your life by making it a number one top priority in your day. Guys, there's a lot of exciting things that happen around Fellowship Church. There really is. But we got to be real careful not to become bored with the awesome. 
We've got to be real careful that as we experience the amazing move of God and the Word of God going out and people's lives being changed, that we just don't become bored or we just don't become routine with that which is so amazing that's happening in our church. The Bible says the Word of God should not return void. In other words, the Word of God will never go out and not have an effect on the fact that it went out to certain people. If children hear it, it will change their lives. If marriage is here, it will change the marriage. If individuals hear it, it will change them. You don't even have to understand all the Word in order for the Word to do a work on you. The Word of God, the Bible says, will never come back without effect. If the Word of God is being spoken, not a man's opinion, not somebody's idea is, but if the Word of God is being taught in a certain place, then lives are going to be radically changed, and it is going to be an amazing thing. I uh, have the opportunity to talk to other pastors and go to other churches from time to time. And every once in a while, a pastor will ask me, well, Pastor Uber, what do you think? What do you think we ought to do? We don't have much of a budget. And what do you think we should do here? Should we do this? We should, should we do that? We can't afford all the lights and we can't afford the cameras and we can't afford, you know, the, the, the back screens, the backdrops, the smoke and, you know, the mirrors and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, look, 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 look don't, don't, waste, don't waste any money on any of that. I said, listen. If you will get on your face before God, if you will pray, if you will ask God to show up, if God moves throughout a service, you won't be able to keep the people from coming back to experience another God move in your church again. That's what it's about. It's not about the smoke, the glass, the mirrors, the lights. It's all about that. It's about God moving in the life of an individual. And that happens when the Word of God is being taught because the Word of God's not returning void. I would just say Hooper's words aren't returning void. His opinions about the Broncos aren't returning void. He didn't, the Hooper, the Bible didn't say anything about that. The Bible says his word won't return void. His word has effect. His word changes life. You've got to lock it in that it is, it is a top priority, God's word, to be in it, to stay in it. This last Sunday we had our kids... Uh, uh, here in the auditorium, and man, I had a head cold, and I was so sick, and Anna's like mad at me. She's like, our grandbabies are going to be up on that platform. You're going to get to church, and I'm like, I can't go. I can't go to church, and she's like, you know, you know, upset with me, and so I called, the, I called the church office, and I got a hold of her IT guy, and I said, look, I want you to upload today's 11 o'clock service. I want you to work Sunday afternoon. I want you to upload that. I said, I'll buy your lunch, but you upload that so me and my wife can see the service Sunday night that happened on Sunday morning because our granddaughter's we're up here on the platform. You grandparents understand what I'm talking about? That only cost me about 50 bucks, but I got it done, and we got it uploaded that Sunday, that, that Sunday afternoon so my wife could see that Sunday night. But I was watching our kids up here at 11 o'clock, about 100 of those kids up here singing worship songs, and then seeing them repeat and say a, a, a word of blessing. They were speaking a word of blessing over you, and then they were walking up explaining what different words meant that were in that blessing that they just spoke over you, and then they spoke it over you again. And I'm thinking, oh, man, that's it right there, see? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to put the Word of God in our children, and when the Word of God goes into our children, they'll learn it as kindergartners and preschoolers, and then they'll get it again at first grade, and then they'll get another recaption of that story in the second grade, then they'll hear it from this direction when they're in the third grade, then they get it from over here, then they get it when they're middle schoolers, then they get it again when they're teenagers because we want them to build their foundation, their life, on what saith the word of God because one of these days they're going to walk through a cemetery and when they walk through a cemetery it's three plus three equals six isn't going to help them but what is going to help them is yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me and you can't tell me another company another institution you can't tell me anywhere where the word of God is being taught into your kids and that is what's going to make life different that's what's going to heal a marriage. That's what's going to make a difference when it comes to a job, when it comes to, when it comes to them making money, when it comes to them supporting a family. It's what saith the Word of God. That's what does not return void. That's what makes a difference in people's lives. So therefore, there has to be this. I'm locking this one in. I'm locking in the fact that the Word of God will take priority and will take precedence in my life over everything else. And it'll be something that I spend daily time in, daily time. Here's the next one, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 on the side screen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean into your own understanding, but seek his will in all you do, and he'll show you which path to take. Here's the second one, I will lean on God over my own understanding. I will lean on God over my own understanding. 
there are just certain things I don't get. There are certain things I can't figure out. There are certain things I don't understand. Matter of fact, all of these things are trust issues. You're going to trust yourself. You're going to trust the government. You're going to trust the boss. You're going to trust God. That's what it is. And what Solomon is saying, in order to have a blessed life, I'm not going to lean into what I think, what I feel, what I imagine. I'm going to lean into what saith the Word of God. And who do we think we are anyway to think that we can figure things out? Our minds can't match up to an almighty God. So we're just, the Solomon said, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to let my emotions overrule me. Look in verse 3. Uh, you don't have this one on the side screen. Let me read it. Chapter 3, verse 7, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, this is Solomon talking, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Here's what he's saying. I will not I find myself wise in my own eyes. That's the third thing he said. He said, I'm going to lock this one in. I'm not going to see myself as wise in my own eyes. I'm not going to do it. And again, it goes back to a trust issue. What, see, what is important is not what you and I see. What is important is what God said because there's so much of this world that is spiritual that we cannot see. The Bible says, Gee, God said, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, saith the Lord. So what Solomon is saying is I'm not going to base it on what I can visibly see because I can't see the enemy that's at work. I can't see the angelic beings that are on my side. I can't see the horses of chariots on fire that are coming against that which is coming against me. So I'm not going to base my life or my understanding on the things that I can see. It's a non-negotiable, he said. Here's non-negotiable number four. He said this. He said, I will not have an unteachable spirit. I will not be unteachable. Proverbs chapter 10 on the side screen. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. So this is what Solomon is saying. He's saying, I will not have an unteachable spirit. I'm not going to refuse to be corrected. I, listen, if punishment needs to come my way, if somebody needs to say something to me, if I need to get that from a child, the Bible says that Naaman heard from a, from, a little, from a little maid. He listened to a little maid that you need to go dip yourself seven times in the river and be healed. But he could have said, who are you telling me what to do? Here's the question that I need to ask you. Are you still teachable? I mean, really, if God said it, would you do it, even though you've been doing it a different way for 25 years? Can you learn from a child? Can you? So if a five-year-old tells you something and they make sense, it goes along with God's Word, would you say, uh-huh, okay, now I hear you, all right. Can you learn from a teenager? Uh-huh. So if you say, uh-huh, that's a little harder, isn't it, there, parents? But what if, can you go back to a teenager and you say, you know what, a couple of weeks ago I was wrong about how I handled that. You know, I just went crazy on you and I'm sorry. And what you said was right. And we're going to implement that into our household instead of what I said. Can you learn? Can you still learn from a, from a teenager? Can you? You know, the Bible teaches us that if you're going to be wise and you're going to be successful, you cannot have an unteachable spirit. You have got to, are you ready for this word? reinvent yourself a lot with every new thing you learn you just reinvent yourself now women are real good at reinventing yourselves men suck at it now think about this women okay women you, you see a new hairstyle so what do you do you go get a new hairstyle you see a new hair color, so what do you do? You go get a, a new hair color. Some of you don't even remember what your hair color was. You see new clothes, so you get new, new clothes. You're reinventing yourself, and God help us. You reinvent yourself with new shoes, new shoes. Lord, help us. New shoes. But have you ever noticed some men that look the same, stay the same, smell the same, Act the same forever. Have you noticed that? Listen, guys, listen. How, how many of you guys over 50 years of age? Would you raise your hand? 
50 years of age. Okay, never hear, hear this from me. Here, uh, you're, you're over 50 with your hat turned around backwards and the right here in the middle. God help you. Look at you. Look at all, look at all 30. You reinvented yourself. That's what you did. But let me, let me just talk to you for a second. Let me say, if you are over 50 years of age, now let me say this to you because I'm over 50 and I want to help you with this and you probably never heard this in church before, but do not let yourself turn in to an old fart. Yeah, you can write that down. F-A-R, you write it on down. Listen to me, men. Listen to me. I know guys that seriously, they think that they, they, they lock into a look, they lock into a demeanor, they lock into an action. Listen, and, and they stay that way their whole life. If you are still using Old Spice aftershave, <laughs> slap yourself. You are not being stable. You are not being, you know, you are not being, you know, the, you, you know what you're being? You're being Boring. That's what you're being. But when God teaches you something, change. Change. I, uh, my dad's dad was uh, raised four boys. Ask me what I remember about them. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. How many times you over at his house? Hundred. I know nothing about him. Ask me if I care. No, I don't. Because he wasn't anybody worth knowing. He was mean. He was ugly. He never told my father he loved him. Not one time. He never hugged one of his four sons and said, I'm proud of you. Not one time that any of my uncles could tell me. He was just a mean, old, fart, stoic man who sat in a chair and watched TV while the grandkids ran around and got in his way. That's it. I know nothing about him, and I could care less. Now, I do know a man who would hug his three boys, tell his daughter how, much, how pretty she was, would laugh a lot, would work like, until he couldn't work anymore, would just have so much fun with other people would constantly wrap his arms around his grown sons and kiss them on the cheek right in the middle of public, and he didn't care if they had a problem with it or not, displayed his love and affection toward his wife on a regular basis, worked when he was working, played when he was playing. He was one of the best men that I know in my, on this planet. You want to know who he was? My daddy. Because my dad refused to be unteachable. My dad knew that there were certain things that he had to do, and it didn't make a difference whether the generation of men before him did it this way or not. My dad was going to be a teachable man. There was a time in my life, guys, that I wasn't a worshiper. I was saved at the age of 12, started studying my Bible at 16, started taking night courses at college when I was 17 years of age. I began to know God's Word, read God's Word, study God's Word. I felt like what I needed to do was have a greater relationship with the Word of God, but I was not a worshiper. I wasn't. But I always felt like I was missing something. I mean, song service would come on, and I'd be looking at my watch, kind of like some of you old farts. I'd be looking at my watch, you know, yeah, about 20 more minutes of that, and that's a pretty good special. Oh, they look pretty good up here. I like the drums now. I like that drum. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, mm -hmm. like that drum. I like that. That's good. Are we about over with this? And then as I studied the Word of God and I found out that God wants you to enter His courts with praise and thanksgiving, when I found out that God sings songs over me and He wants me to sing songs over Him, when I found out that the worshipers went first and many times praise and worship was what opened us up into the very presence of the very intimate levels of a relationship with an almighty God. It was then that I remember all the way back to the Avalon Theater. Anybody remember the Avalon Theater? Our church became a worshiping church at the Avalon Theater. Guys like Daryl Evans, guys like Ross Parsley, guys like uh, uh, out of New York, uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle, people like that, all of a sudden we begin to experience worship and now 
Now I say to my daddy, God, I say, teach me. God, if you want me to worship you like this, I'll worship you like this. I'll give you a touchdown worship. Here's a touchdown worship in the name of Jesus. Touchdown worship for my Lord Jesus. If you want me to worship you on my knees, I'll worship you on my knees. Because here's, here's what I do with God. Anytime I find myself in a mess, I always assume it's me. I never go, God, why didn't you do this? And how come you ain't coming through with that? The first thing I do is I go to God and I go, God, what am I doing wrong? Because if you'll tell me, I'll change it right now. Right now. And all of a sudden, I became a worshiper. And I became a lover of God. Because my Heavenly Father continually tells us, I want you to be this, but in this stage of life now, I need you to be this. And what you were as a young couple raising kids, you were this, but now in the empty nest, I need you to be this. And, and, and when God comes and He tells you something, He's telling you this because He wants change to take place in your life. But here's what scares me about some of you old farts, and I love you, but listen to me. If 10 years ago you were sitting in our worship services back here in the back like this, looking at your watch, waiting for some, where the worship service to end, and now it is 2012, if you're still sitting in this brand new worship center with your arms folded, looking at your watch, still waiting for the time to go past, you're still the same old fart you were 10 years ago. You're boring. I wouldn't want to live with you. I wouldn't want to be married to you. And I'm telling you, the people around you won't tell you this, but you need to change. You need to be a person that will love your Heavenly Father. You need to be a person that will break generational curses. You need to be a person that will hug your grown sons, put your arms around your grown daughters, and be to them what God wants you to be. Do I got time for one more thing? I promise you, this is just part one. That's just four. That's just four out of ten. Let me give you this one. The Bible says, watch this. The Bible says in Joshua 24 and verse 15, I'm talking about some non-negotiables here. I'm talking about some things you lock in for a successful life. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 20, 24, but if serving the Lord, this is Joshua talking to his generation of people, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you're going to serve. Whether it be the gods of your ancestor, serve beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But as for me and my household, oh, we're going to serve the Lord. Yeah, yeah, let me explain to you how that works. Fifteen and a half year old, listen, in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's how we're going to do it. Well, I don't want to go to church. Well, guess what? You don't get an opinion. Because up in my house, the opinion has already been made. And if I want your opinion, I'll give you your opinion. But at 15 and a half years old, I don't think you can whip me. I don't think you can. At 15 and a half, I don't think you can. Now, at 17, when you think you can, I'm going to call my brother, my wife. I'm going to call my brother-in-laws. I'm going to bring an army to the house. And one of two things are going to happen. You are going to serve the Lord in this house, or I'm putting you out of this house. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is a non-negotiable absolutely blows my mind when I see parents let a 13-year-old daughter run their household. You know what we bought when my son was 15? Boxing gloves. <laughs> Ask him about it sometime. It was fun. I think Anna used them on me more than I used them on him, but anyway. But this way he says, he says, he says this, he says, far be it from us that we would forsake the Lord for other gods, he said. Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things of heaven, not on things of earth. Lock it in, lock it in, lock it in. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, nor the name of their heaven by which you can be saved. Jesus said, how can we go to heaven? He said, I'm the way to go to heaven. You don't get a choice in this. You, you, you shouldn't even get a go. But my father said, if I do this, you get a go. So by me, no other name, no one comes to the Father but by me. That's a non-negotiable. Do you know this is an election year? Does everybody, everybody know it's an election year? Okay, all right. Everybody excited about an election year? All right, I don't want to get ugly. Just don't get ugly. But what we could have is a Mormon, or we could have, I don't know, some people say he's a closet Muslim. 
He might be an assembly of God pastor for all I know. I don't know. Here's the second thing. I don't care. But what I do know is whoever ends up in office, the next fashionable religion will be one or the other. And many people will want to know, well, what's this like? Or what was that like? Or maybe I'll do a little bit more research into this. Or I'll do a little bit more research into that. Listen to me very carefully. I don't care if you call yourself a Muslim. I don't care if you call yourself a Mormon. I don't care if you call yourself an Assembly of God. I don't care if you call yourself a Catholic. I don't care if you call yourself a Baptist. The Bible says that only people that are going to heaven are those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, no matter what you want to call yourself. And can I just say one more thing, one more thing, and then I'm out of here? Maybe two? Well, just one. (laughs) Have you noticed now that in national events, in order to keep it PC, there's a moment of silence? They don't even call it a moment of silent prayer anymore. They used to. Now they say, can we take a moment of silence? There's a bombing that's taking place in the embassy. Can we have a moment of silence for those family members who's lost loved ones in the shooting at Aurora in a movie theater? Well, can I just say this to all of us that are born again, blood-bought people that love Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? From now on, when there is a moment of silence, I do hope that every one of us that are saved will bow our head and we will pray to our Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring the Comforter known as the Holy Spirit into the lives of those that have been affected so that they too will come to know God as their Heavenly Father through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of that one moment of silence, may us as Christians end it by saying... See ya!